Thank you very much. Okay. Um, and what we were what we're doing here in correlating is we're matching units from various places in terms of their ages of the sedimentary strata and some igneous rocks as well. And the, the, the paper contains brief stratigraphic descriptions that complement um, each column of the chart. And I need to acknowledge, we need to acknowledge uh, just un montón de colegas y estudiantes who helped um, assemble this knowledge of the stratigraphy of, of a really large region. And one thing I want to say about this chart, this, this correlation exercise, is it's a work in progress. It will never be finished because new data are coming in every day. And if people find things they don't like about this chart, I would love to hear about it because I will constantly update it and then pass it off to Maria Isabel or somebody who will, can keep it moving forward. I'm going to end the show for a second, Roberto, because I can't advance it for some reason. Okay, this is one of two figures in the in the paper that Maria Isabel put together. And it shows the locations of the various columns that, that we present in the correlation chart. And you can see they run from up here in the Southwestern United States and Baja, the Baja Peninsula, all the way south through Mexico and into uh, Guatemala. And finally, um, we have columns in Colombia as well. I think maybe it doesn't like my laser pointer. Yeah, I'm gonna have to go back to a regular pointer here. Okay, so this is the correlation chart. And um, an important point to make is that part of the data repository in this paper has a full size high resolution um, version of the column. Or if, if that is unsatisfactory, I can send them to you directly. But what the, uh, chart consists of it is 31 columns of that display the chronostratigraphic correlation of Mississippian through Eocene strata. And as I mentioned before, the columns are distributed from the Baja Peninsula and the Colorado Plateau to Colombia. And the dominant uh, depositional environments of the various formations that are correlated here are indicated by patterns in each of the in each of the blocks. And then there's a color overlay of tectonic events that um, are related primarily to the Gulf of, of California and the Gulf of Mexico and subduction history of Western Laurentia during the Carboniferous and Permian, um, subduction beneath Pangaea during the Permian through Jurassic and subduction beneath North America through from the late Jurassic through the Eocene. So that basically the chart uh, spans the assembly and breakup of Pangaea. Okay, so there's not much to talk about there, is there? Okay, I'm, I'm just kidding. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to show you how basically we got to this point. And then after that, I'm going to review um, some, some types of stratigraphy if this is essentially a lecture from my, my stratigraphy class. And then I'm gonna to return to the Jurassic part of these columns, partly because I know something about the Jurassic, or I think I do. And also it's a part of the, of the geologic uh, history of Mexico that seems to uh, excite a lot of um, emotional discussion. So 
let's just back up and talk a little bit about stratigraphy. And, and I'm going to talk about four types of, of stratigraphic units. There are lithostratigraphic units, biostratigraphic units, chronostratigraphic units, and geochronologic units. So I'm going to take these one by one. Okay, so lithostratigraphy is the study of stratigraphic units on the basis of their physical characteristics. This is basically how we think about stratigraphic units when we make a geologic map. We just look at them and decide which formation we're in on the basis of what it looks like. And obviously, this is a photograph from the Colorado Plateau. It's one of the best places in the world to um, talk about lithostratigraphy. And basically, when I talk about the Chinle Formation, or the Wingate sandstone, I am implicitly talking about lithostratigraphic units. And we can correlate lithostratigraphic units. Here's a lithocorrelation of those two units. Here's the Wingate, and here's the Chin Li, um, correlated on the basis of their characteristics between about the Green River in Utah and the Uncompagre uplift in Western Colorado here. Here's the state line between Utah and Colorado. And it's interesting, you can see not much happens between the two localities for the Chinle and the um, and, and the Wingate. But if we if we go below it or above it, we can see very important changes. For example, this unit in the um, called the Moenkopi formation is quite thick in Utah and it's gone. It's it 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 is missing. Um, in the Uncompagre uplift in Colorado. And we see a similar thing here taking place in the Navajo sandstone in the Carmel Formation. They go away. So there must have been, there must have been some sort of tectonic activity that took place during the deposition of the Moenkopi, and then again later during the deposition of these later sandstones. But we, we don't really, unless we know the ages of those formations, we don't really know when that happened. This is probably the most famous uh, lithostratigraphy in the world. This is the Grand Canyon. And what we can see here is that simply by looking at the sequence of, of the lithologies, we can tell that uh, there were various events here. We had deposition of this older succession. It was faulted and tilted, and then it was depositionally overlain by a whole younger succession of strata. And this is what they look like. It's, it's obviously a spectacular succession. And so we can build a geologic history here simply by looking at superposition, the placement of unconformities. And, um, but we don't necessarily know when those events took place. So we have to add a couple of other um, types of stratigraphy to this mix in order to get a better idea of the geologic history. And we start with biostratigraphy here, and this is um, the characterization, definition, and correlation of rock units on the basis of their fossil content. And when we talk about biostratigraphic units, we're talking about um, divisions of the, of the stratigraphic section on the basis of changes in species present in the rocks. And it's important to note that um, biostratigraphic units commonly don't correspond at all to lithostratigraphic units. And here's an example of that. Here is a column of lithostratigraphy, and we can see that it's, it's divided up into formations. I think this is in uh, uh, New York or, or the upper Midwest. But we see that the formations are then split into members which correspond a little bit more intimately to the lithologic subdivisions of the rocks. But when we look at the um, trilobites that are present in those rocks, we can see that the range of the fossils doesn't correlate very well with the lithostratigraphy. Okay, so there, there's a big difference between stratigraphic units that are defined from their fossil content versus those defined on their lithology. And then we get to something that's really, really critical here. And this is chronostratigraphy. And this is the study of the relationship of stratigraphic units to geologic time. 
And a chronostratigraphic unit is, is an interval of, of strata that was deposited during a specified interval of geologic time. And I've just put the names here, but for example, we would refer to the Jurassic system as the interval of rocks that were deposited during Jurassic time. And I'm part of the reason I'm doing this is because one of the corrections that I make most commonly when I review people's, people's papers on stratigraphy is the misuse of adjectives that refer to these kinds of rocks. These are rocks, not time. And so what we do is we use the adjectives lower, middle, and upper to describe divisions of the Jurassic. For example, lower Jurassic rocks, not early Jurassic rocks, okay? Etch that in your memories. And then finally, there are geochronologic units. And this is, this is critical because this is where we get to geologic time. And these are the more familiar terms like periods and epochs. And when we refer to geologic time, we use the adjectives early, middle, and late to describe, for example, epochs, which are divisions of Jurassic time. So we would refer to early Jurassic time early Jurassic sedimentary basin, early Jurassic fault, early Jurassic paleogeography. I'm on a soapbox now, you can tell. And then finally, we get to the, this a critical um, aspect of geology that we all take for granted, and that is the geologic time scale. And what the geologic time scale is, is a hierarchy of, of global chronostratigraphic units. Okay, so these are rocks deposited during certain periods of time. And this, these are type units that are de defined to serve as a standard reference to which we can refer to the age of rocks anywhere we find them. And here's the most recent version of a geologic uh, time scale that I have. We're all familiar with this. And we see that, you know, the, that all of the, um, chronostratigraphic units here, for example, the Carboniferous, the Permian, and the Triassic actually have ages or age ranges assigned to them. Okay, so that's kind of the part we commonly take for granted. In order to know that, we have to be able to somehow take those units that were originally defined on the basis of their characteristics and their fossil contents and and assign ages to them. Okay, so the, essentially the steps uh, in making the geologic time scale was we use the standard stratigraphic principles of superposition, faunal succession and cross cutting relations to determine the relative age of units. And this was done by a very small handful of white males in the British Isles about 250 years ago in a very short period of time. They determined, they determined the relative orders of these rocks, but they had no idea how old the rocks were. And, they, and as a result of that, they had no idea how old the world was, how old the earth was. And um, an important point I'd like to make here is that the, the, the divisions of the geologic time scale were originally described or defined from these lithostratigraphic relations and the fossil content or the biostratigraphy. So uh, once the Jurassic was defined, people everywhere could, could, uh, could recognize Jurassic rocks on the basis of their fossils, okay? And then the next step that was in incredibly important and is ongoing, is to establish the ages of these rock divisions by dating interbedded appropriate rock types. And these could be tufts, they can be volcanic flows, and there are other ways of doing this. But a, a point that I want to emphasize, and I have sometimes I have to harangue my um, geochronologic colleagues and friends, is that Jurassic rocks will always be Jurassic rocks, unless for some reason they become politically incorrect. But it's quite possible and that the age boundaries of the Jurassic will shift a little bit 
as we learn more about um, the ages, the actual ages of the Jurassic with improved geochronology. Okay, and so getting back to the correlation chart, the most important form of correlation is chronostratigraphic correlation. And this represents matching rocks of similar age using geochronology. And the rocks can be correlated on the basis of tephra layers, into instantaneous or catastrophic depositional uh, events, soil horizons, uh, although these might contain a lot of, of time in themselves, transgressive, regressive events. But again, we're trying to then date them so we know how old they are. And I'm going to admit something right now. And that is, in the absence of more precise data and methods, sometimes we, and I should probably just say I, rely on my instinct, my biases, and my experience with rocks, okay? So you can take that for what it's worth. Okay, so chronostratigraphic correlation is, is kind of the key to understanding how the world has evolved. And, and, and this is the motivation slide. Why should we bother? Because correlation of stratigraphic columns allows us to evaluate time equivalent processes everywhere in the world through the past. We can map time equivalent depositions, paleogeography, et cetera, et cetera. We can evaluate after that alternative tectonic scenarios to explain these maps. And in my humble estimation, in the absence of correlation, geology is only chaos. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna focus in on some columns from just a few of the columns that we've, um, I showed you on the big plate from the Triassic through the uh, Jurassic on the time scale. And these columns come from Northern Sonora, uh, from Southeastern Arizona and Southwestern New Mexico in the United States, the Chihuahua Trough, the Rio Grande Embayment, because this represents the, the US part of the Gulf of Mexico. This is the area uh, around Galeana in Nuevo Leon, the Valle del de, de Huizachal, which I think is in uh, Tamaulipas, the Huayacacotla uplift in Hidalgo, uh, the Tampico foreland, and finally Chiapas. And one of the things I'm gonna say is that one of the reasons I'm proud of this chart is my colleagues and students contributed a lot of the ages that have helped to sort out um, the columns of Northern Mexico. And what, what these little symbols represent is where we actually have um, uranium lead ages from an igneous rock in the stratigraphic section from a, a, a tuff or a, flow, a, a pyroclastic flow perhaps. And the, the black zircons here represent where we have stratigraphic ages from um, the youngest zircons that we find in sandstones. Okay, so there's a little bit of there's a little bit of interpretation that goes into this, and sometimes we have I've shown the error bars here. Now there are some other kinds of ages here that come from using um, strontium, is strontium isotopic data um, from carbonate units here that are interbedded in the Minas Viejas formation of northeastern Mexico. And there are also some recent strontium isotopic data from evaporites that um, were, were collected from diapiric salt in the Gulf of Mexico. Now this, this is a remark, this data set from the carbonate units near Galeana is, is an incredible data set that was recently um, uh, generated by Natalia Amesqua at the Servicio Geológico Mexicano uh, um, and pr presented last year at a, um, a conference in Mexico City. The problem with the um, strontium isotopic data um, from the Luan is that evaporites are, are easily recrystallized, which tends to reset the strontium isotopes. 
and there's no stratigraphic control. These are basically collected from diapirs. One of the observations that leads us to believe that these might be valid um, um, ages is that they're consistent from the uh, from uh, both sides of the Gulf of Mexico, from the Texas Gulf Coast and from the uh, Isthmian Basin in uh, offshore Veracruz. So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to focus on this column um, in Arizona and New Mexico because it illustrates how um, we were able to use interbedded volcanoclastic units and conglomerates, which are very difficult to date, to improve our understanding of the ages of this column and then to say something about the tectonic evolution of that part of, of the Jurassic Basin system. Okay, so there's a very important Jurassic volcano sedimentary succession in Southern Arizona. And the sedimentary rocks are generally referred to as the glance formation or the glance conglomerate. And in certain parts of Arizona, the glance formation is interbedded with caldera fill and outflow ignimbrites that um, provide an opportunity for uranium lead ages. And the glance formation is a, is, was deposited largely in alluvial fans. And so it, it lacks fossils. The biostratigraphy is no help. And, and so we really need those geochronological ages to uh, calibrate this section. So here's the, here's the part of the world that I'm talking about. If you look down here in this uh, lower right part of the figure, you can see that the area of interest is in Southeastern Arizona, uh, Sonora lies down here and Chihuahua over here. And the Glance conglomerate crop, crops out widely in Southern Arizona from the Canelo Hills all the way to the Chiricahua Mountains and their equivalent rocks in New Mexico and Sonora where it's also called Glance. I'm going to talk primarily about a, a location in the central part of the Canelo Hills here, but I'll show you illustrations of glance from near Bisbee, Arizona in the Mule Mountains as well. Now, a, an interesting aspect of this part of the world is that there are Jurassic granitic rocks that have been interpreted as the fill of calderas that were formed during, during the Jurassic. There are also Laramide calderas and Younger calderas in, in Southern Arizona. But um, these Jurassic rocks have alternatively been um, interpreted as um, the result of subduction related arc magmatism or emplacement within an extensional regime, perhaps some sort of a, a, a rift environment. So if we go over to Bisbee, uh, a really wonderful aspect of the Glance conglomerate is it shows the presence of syndepositional normal faults. We can see that the Glance thickens dramatically each time we cross a fault so that it's, it's quite thick here, um, several hundred meters thick. And it also illustrates the progressive erosion of these uh, footwall blocks. We can see here a limestone clast conglomerate that was derived from the Paleozoic section, a metamorphic class conglomerate that was, or a mixed, excuse me, this is a mixed class conglomerate that was uh, derived from the Paleozoic strata and from class of the penal schist here, or from the penal schist. And then we also, also have a schist class conglomerate that was also almost exclusively derived from the basement here. So we see progressive erosion of the uplifted blocks and progress, progressive um, deposition adjacent to these um, rift related normal faults. The problem with the Bisbee section here is that there are no interbedded um, igneous rocks. And the only thing that we can say is that it was probably deposited at least in part after the emplacement of this Jurassic granite, which is about 170 million years old, 
at Bisbee. So what I wanna do is I wanna take you to three sites here in the Canelo Hills, the Huachuca Mountains and the Mustang Mountains and just talk about the section. I'm gonna start in the Canelo Hills, then I'll move to the Mustangs and then I'll move to the Huachucas. So there's a, there's a fabulous uh, volcano sedimentary succession exposed in the Canelo Hills that consists of very thick uh, pyroclastic rocks here that are referred to as the Canelo Hills Volcanics. And then there's a, a section of um, silicic breaches with slide blocks of Permian rocks um, interbedded in them. And then eventually what happens is the section becomes more and more conglomeratic. And what we see here are outflow sheets or, or thinner ignimbrites interbedded with the conglomerate. And there's, a, a, there's an andesitic breccia um, interbedded in the section here. And finally, at the top of the section, there's a little bit of Aeolian sandstone capping the preserved section there. And uh, a structural geologist um, named Chuck Kluth um, did his dissertation on these, on these rocks. And he referred to them as the rocks of Mount Hughes. He just called this whole section the um, basically the Mount Hughes formation, although it was, it, he called it rocks of Mount Hughes because it's an informal term. And three of the four members are interpreted to be, be present here overlying the Canela Hills Volcanics. So I thought it seems like a reasonable place to go to try to figure out the age of the glance. Although there are a lot of people who can't agree on what to call these rocks, it seems like a good start would be to, to date some rocks here. So I collected um, several samples of the, of, of the pyroclastic rocks through the section. And this, this is a, a measured section of that, of that same interval that shows the Canelo Hills volcanics here and overlain by the um, Mount Hughes formation or the Glance conglomerate, whatever you wanna call it, and the position of the sections. And, and basically, the, the, I'll, I'll show some of the data, but the results here were very satisfactory. The Canelo Hills volcanics and the immediately overlying um, breaches and ignimbrites yielded ages of 178 million years. The, um, the ignimbrites um, yielded ages of 175 and 173 million years in the section. So we have, we have a section of ranging in age from about 178 or 179 to 173 million years. So caldera related uh, uh, magmatism probably ended about 178. And then depending upon what kind of unconformities are present in this section, the, uh, the conglomerate dominated section picked up about 175 or, or near there. So here are just some photographs. Here's a slide block of Permian sandstone in um, rhyolite breaches, probably related to domes in the caldera. So these may have been slide blocks that came off the edge of the caldera. This is what the glance conglomerate looks like, not a great outcrop, but it's pretty standard alluvial fan conglomerate. Here's another um, photograph of the glance. And this is a really important section because it was used originally to calibrate the North American polar wander path, the mag magnetic stratigraphy that goes into understanding how North America drifted during the Jurassic. And this represents a conglomerate test uh, um, on, on one of the conglomerate intervals. And a lot of these ignimbrites are, are filled with paleomag holes. But the, uh, uh, an important thing to point out is these rocks were originally inferred to be about 150 million years old. And so I, what I'm arguing is that they're about 25 million years older than that. Here's what one of the ignimbrites looks like. This one is 175 million. And these are the data. These are, these are amazingly well-behaved rocks. They don't have a lot of inherited zircons. These are, all of the, these are all of the zircons in the rock. So we don't see older stuff. Now I'm moving up to the Mustang Mountains. There's a very interesting section here where the ignimbrites, these are the Paleozoic limestones here, and the ignimbrites fill a valley. 
there's a valley cut into this, into the Paleozoic limestone. And it comes over here like this and keeps going like that. So basically what we're seeing are ignimbrites that are filling a valley. And although you can't see it here, the, the glance conglomerate, the conglomerates overlie these ignimbrites. We kind of sneaked onto private property to collect some samples up here. And so we collected two samples um, from the edge of the Paleo Valley for ignimbrites. The, um, the results are a little bit out of order. The bottom sample yielded, a, yielded an age of 176 and the upper one, 179. You can see they just barely overlap at uncertainty. But the interesting thing is that, is that these ignimbrites are the appropriate age to be outflow sheets from the older rocks, from the caldera related rocks of the Canelo Hills volcanics that I showed you in the, in the earlier section. And Peter Lipman came to the same, same conclusion just on the basis of the phenocryst. Um, they're not called phenocryst, the, the lapilli um, assemblages in these various ignimbrites. And so finally we collected, uh, a student and I uh, collected another sample right at the very bottom of the Glantz conglomerate where it overlies Paleozoic rocks in the Huachuca Mountains. And this gave us our youngest age. It's, it's roughly the same age as the, um, as the youngest tuff that we dated in the Canelo Hills over here. But there are no ignimbrites in the section of conglomerate above this. As we move to the Southwest, the rocks become younger and younger. So this dates the, this is our youngest date on the Glantz conglomerate. And then there are a bunch of undated rocks here that are then overlain by lower Cretaceous. Um, strata. And so what you see is that the section at Canelo Pass is right here. And these represent, this represents the Parker Canyon caldera. It's a pretty big caldera here. And it's delineated by the distribution of this, uh, this uh, what is it? It's um, basically a crystal rich tuff and ver a very thick unit that filled that caldera. So what I'm gonna argue here is that the igneous rocks in the, and near the Canela Hills provide nice preliminary evidence for a transition from um, caldera-related magmatism to um, post-caldera extension in the age interval, the time interval between 178 and 172 million years. So we actually have some decent ages on, on the Glantz formation, which was previously not very well dated because of its continental depositional environment. So going back to that, uh, to that section, this would be, this is how I would convert that information that I just showed you um, into my column. So this is the Canela Hills volcanics, obviously don't have a very good handle on the older age because the only age we have is right at the top of the Canela Hills volcanics. Some, some ages in this interbedded section of ignimbrites and conglomerate uh, that indicates that this, this interval crosses between the uh, early and middle Jurassic. And then although I haven't talked about it, I've also got some other data on a, a, a late uh, Jurassic section or an upper Jurassic section that is both marine and continental. There's a little bit of conglomerate in that section and there are also subaqueous pillow lavas. And the interesting thing is that corresponds quite well with an interval of strata in the, uh, in the Chihuahua trough called the La Casita Formation that Carmen Tarango worked on for her master's degree. These ages are actually the result of a a master's project by Enrique Ruiz. So, so to summarize what I've just said in a lot of words is that early Jurassic caldera related um, magmatism probably related to back extension, although we can debate that if you'd like, ended in the time interval 179 to 172 million years. And this would be equivalent to what we call the Nasus formation 
in, in uh, northern and central Mexico, north, north central Mexico. And following that uh, caldera related magmatism, continued extension produced asymmetrical graben systems that were largely amagmatic that persisted into middle Jurassic time. And this would be the upper part of the Plumosis formation in Chihuahua. This would be early salt deposition in the Gulf of Mexico, and it would be equivalent to the Minas Viejas formation in onshore Northeastern Mexico. And then finally, late Jurassic extension culminated in marine incursion that came all the way from the Gulf of Mexico and basically invaded Southern um, Arizona and Northern Sonora at the same time as mafic mantle derived magmas were emplaced in that marine basin. And this probably took place in a back arc region during Kimmeridgian time about 154 to maybe 151 million years. So this would be the Cucurpe formation in Sonora, the uh, Crystal Cave formation of Arizona. It would be late um, salt deposition in onshore ne uh, northeastern Mexico, and it would be the La Casita formation in Chihuahua. And so this is my parting shot. This is, you can do a lot with correlated columns. And I think, um, I'm going to stop there and invite questions. Can I do that? I'm going to stop sharing now, Roberto. Okay. Thank you, Tim. That was that was uh, really cool to see how you could take the the field work and the the uh, the lab work into your correlation chart and explain how that was put together. Thank you. Um, so um, we're ready to take questions from the audience. O preguntas de la audiencia. <laughs> eh, Luigi, adelante. Mm, sí, eh, la, la, la hago porque si tengo que escribirla, me termino, termina antes la plática que yo de, um, de escribirla. Eh, Tim. Puedo hacer otra pregunta en español, espero, ¿verdad? Sí, ok, está bien. No, no nada más pregunta. La, eh, estaba pensando ahora en le, de las últimas diapositivas, donde hablabas un poco de la evolución jurásica del Golfo, eh, del, eh, pues, de los cambios que hay desde un régimen magmático relacionado a la extensión eh, de Becarc, probablemente, etcétera, etcétera, con toda la evolución. Eh, y en un momento estaba pensando a la cuestión del famoso arco Nasas. Entonces, bueno, el arco Nasas de alguna manera el, ha sido manejado como pues un arco volcánico, o sea, un arco relacionado con la subducción, la famosa placa mezcalera y todo esto. Pero... En realidad, yo siempre tuve la impresión y vamos... Eh, eh, Creo que un poco esas diapositivas iban por ahí, que eh, todo ese magmatismo que está asociado a NASAS, con, al, al arco NASAS, entre comillas, en realidad podría ser algo más. Podría ser, simplemente ser la respuesta del rifting, de la ruptura del golfo. Y entonces el, el ascenso estenosférico, el, la fusión parcial, eh, el emplazamiento de rocas magmáticas, evidentemente, que, pero nada tiene que ver con la solución. Es decir, ¿Tú estás convencido que necesitas una placa en solución para generar el arconazas? ¿O hay la posibilidad de que fundamentalmente este concepto, para así decirlo, se tenga que, eh, se pueda ajustar o se tenga que ajustar? Um, gracias, Luigi. Es, un, es una buena pregunta. Uh, de verdad, me gusta el modelo de Martini y Ortega Gutiérrez, um, que la formación nazis es más consistente con uh, magmatismo relacionado a uh, la extensión de la corteza continental en una zona tras arco. Y hay un... Revisité una, un, 
artículo muy importante de, de Krebs y Ruiz. Y mucho del mundo, incluido a uh, Kathy Busby, está feliz con la idea o la hipótesis que las calderas en el sur de Arizona son los re resultados de un arco. Pero, de acuerdo a Krebs y Ruiz, uh, la geoquímica está compatible con un ambiente um, extensivo. Y, y también este es consistente con la correlación de esas calderas con la formación NASA. ¿sí? Una cosa que necesitamos explicar es cuando vamos un poco al norte en California, um, hay un batolito del Jurásico que se llama el, uh, la batolita de Sierra Nevada, que es un resultado. Todo el mundo acepta que este volumen de, de granitos está um, el resultado de subducción de la placa farallón posiblemente. Una ventaja de la correlación que hemos visto y, y que ne necesitamos extender al norte, a los Estados Unidos más al norte, es que debemos explicar por qué tuvimos un arco, un batolito muy grande al norte en California y cuando acercamos a um, la frontera entre los Estados Unidos y México, eh, ¿cómo se dice? El ambiente del magnetismo cambia. Y he visto recientemente un, una plática muy, muy interesante de Todd Lamaskin. Y tiene un modelo, pienso que está publicado o va a ser publicado muy, muy como pronto en el boletín de GSA, que uh, el, el tipo de subducción fue muy diferente en los Estados Unidos y tuvimos una transición hacia, hacia el sur hasta un tipo de magmatismo que fue un resultado de slab rollback. Y durante el emplazamiento de magmas de la formación NASAS, en el mismo tiempo tuvimos, um, como se dice, intrusivos jurásicos en la península baja y más al, al oeste. Y podemos considerar posiblemente que la formación NASA realmente fue um, emplazado, depositado en una, un ambiente de trasarco. Y, y es, otra vez más, es, es, es la ventaja de, de, de las correlaciones. Podemos correlacionar mejor las el magmatismo del jurásico en, en California con el magmatismo en, en, en México, en el sur de los Estados Unidos. Ok, gracias. Por nada. Eh, ¿Alguien más tiene alguna pregunta que le quisiera hacer a, a Tim? Eh, Roberto, yo tengo un pequeño, digamos, anuncio, comentario. Y es que eh, Tim eh, mencionó dos trabajos, eh, más o menos recientes, en donde se fecha la sal Luan y también la sal de Campeche, o digamos la sal en el lado mexicano. Eh, uno de estos trabajos eh, lo hicieron Jim Pindel, Bodo Weber y eh, colaboradores, y está en eh, el volumen especial, y simplemente quería compartir con todos en el chat eh, el vínculo de este trabajo mm, dado que no va a haber una presentación formal al respecto, hemos invitado a Jim Pindel y él va a dar una charla un poco diferente pero 
eh, para que eh, todos estén enterados pues que eh, hay, eh, se modificó un poco eh, el fechamiento de, de, de la sal, ¿no es cierto? Que o, hoy en día se sabe que es un poquito más antigua eh, en el Jurásico y este trabajo es, es interesante y, y Tim lo mencionó. Gracias. Gracias, V. Eh, ¿Alguien más quisiera comentar? Eh, Mónica Ramírez tiene una pregunta. Dice, es un poco sí, filosófica. Este, dice que la va a preguntar en español. Eh, Tim, ¿qué? Eh, Uh, do you want me to read the, the question for you in English or you can? No, no, no. You can read it in, in Spanish. I'm, I'm reading it at the same time. Okay. Dice, la, la, la pregunta es, ¿por qué es necesario establecer edades absolutas en las unidades cronoestratigráficas? Dice, si las extinciones no ocurren al mismo tiempo en todo el mundo, ¿por qué las unidades geocronológicas deben empezar al mismo tiempo en todo el mundo? ¿Cuál es el objetivo de asignar una edad absoluta a cada división temporal de la historia geológica, si a veces no tiene sentido localmente. Ah, sí, es, es una pregunta filosófica, ¿no? Sí, um, en ese caso hay algunas extinciones. Ok, voy a reempezar. Eh, los conceptos de extinciones en, en el registro fósil han cambiado un poco uh, después de la como se, la, como se dice, la realización que fueron extinciones mundiales, ¿sí? Y seguramente hay extinciones más o menos síncronas como en el límite cretácico uh, cenozoico pero pienso que una cosa importante es que necesitamos una escala, una, uh, ¿cómo se dice? La, la escala uh, temporal geológico para comparar uh, las rocas en todo el mundo. Y si las definiciones de las unidades como Cretácico fueron hecho temprano en, en la historia de, de, de geología o pensamiento geo, geológico. Y pienso que es un, es un buen, lo que tenemos es un buen lugar para empezar, para comunicar sobre eventos síncronos um, para discutir paleo, paleogeografía, para discutir uh, eventos tectónicos um, que pueden ser un poco controversiales y seguramente con uh, metodología mejor en, en convenciones, en procesos o, o técnicos geocronológicos, vamos a, debemos uh, cambiar un poco nuestros conceptos de, uh, de, de la evolución de, de, de la tierra y los procesos, procesos de deposición. Pero necesitamos, y no sé la, la palabra, necesitamos un formato, un rubric para, para discutir los con, conceptos difíciles que estamos interesados en resolver, ¿sí? Sí, es una, una pregunta muy filosófica, ¿verdad? De Mónica. Nada, de nada, Mónica. Mónica, da las gracias. Y es que si algunas extinciones pueden ser de diferente edad, de diferentes ambientes, este, pero aún así pues tenemos que poner en el mismo, 
en, en, en la misma plantilla los, los eventos, los procesos que, que, que observamos, ¿verdad? Eh, quiero ver si alguien más tiene alguna pregunta para Tim. Eh, si no es así, yo quisiera, eh, eh, a ver, aquí hay una, mira. Alejo, Alejo Rodríguez va a regresar a, a hablar con Asas antes que yo. Eh, la pregunta de, de Alejo dice, hola Tim, regresando a la Conasas, ¿qué piensas sobre las firmas geoquímicas típicas de subducción en las rocas de la formación Nasas que presenta el doctor Barbosa ¿verdad? en 2020, donde se ven magmas calcoalcalinos con firma de subducción? Esos datos no serían este, concordantes con, con el modelo de Martini. Bueno, Alejandro. Gracias por la pregunta. Eh, y debes uh, tomar en cuenta que no estoy un uh, petrólogo ignio. Pero en, en mi opinión, los uh, diagramas de uh, discriminación por, um, por rocas ignias uh, son, deben ser consideradas con un poco de, ¿cómo se dice? Uh, cuidado, cuida. Y um, tengo una amiga, un colega que se llama Nancy McMillan. Y no recuerdo exactamente, es un, es un buen petróloga ignia. Y dice, ok, Tim, cuando tenemos magmas, Uh, que encuentran una, una parte de la corteza que fue construida por un arco, es muy probable que las, los magmas van a ser contaminadas por la firma um, bioquímica del, um, del arco. Y pienso que podemos tener también uh, la otra situación cuando si tuvimos un rift en una época de la historia de la, de la corteza, es posible que uh, magmas más jóvenes pueden ser contaminadas por la, la firma del rift. Es, 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 es muy probable que mi explicación, ex, explicación es un poco uh, Uh, reversada, pero es, es, esta es un, una parte de, del problema. La otra es, es cuando usamos estos tipos de diagramas y hablo de un, un petrógrafo, pe, ¿cómo se dice? Petrólogo sedimentario. E, y en, en mi carrera he usado Muchos diagramas de tipo Dickinson, ¿sí? de, de composiciones de areniscas, y muchos, muchas veces, como 50% del tiempo, los campos en que encontramos nuestro, nuestros uh, conteos de puntos de areniscas uh, no, como si te, no están de acuerdo que con el ambiente uh, tectónica de una, una cuenca uh, que está interpretada de otros datos. Y necesitamos, usamos nuestra, como se dice, experiencia para interpretar correctamente estos diagramas. No, no, no digo que necesitamos, um, como se dice, ignorar los, los diagramas um, discriminatorias, pero de discriminación. Pero pienso que es importante de, de tener cuidado cuando interpretamos estos uh, diagramas. Bien, Tim. No sé si, si podría yo participar un poco en esta discusión. Me gusta la discusión del Arconazas. Eh, 
eh, al igual que tú, Tim, yo viví en, en Nuevo México, en el Rift, entonces yo sé que puedo ver una, una caldera ignimbritas coexistiendo con, con, con el Rift, pero eh, acompañada de, de derrames de basaltos, de basaltos que en el, en el Rift del Río Grande son relativamente poco voluminosos, pero lo que no había nunca en el Rift del Río Grande son andesitas. Eh, hace poco estuve con Gabriel Chávez en el área de Caopas y a, eh, lo que más me, me impactó es que la secuencia de, de andesitas es muy potente. Eh, casi no hay, o pues si no hay eh, eh, intercalaciones de, de rocas sedimentarias en esa secuencia. Eh, hay andesitas y hay eh, ignimbritas, pero ahí no hay basaltos. Entonces yo creo que eh, una de las, de las cosas que a mí eh, me hace... Eh, eh, me, bueno, me hace ruido y no, no puedo entender la relación entre eh, depósitos extensionales en, en eh, por ejemplo, Huizachal o por ejemplo en, en Chiapas, donde las rocas no, no hay basaltos. O sea, no, en, 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 en Ciudad Victoria no hay basaltos, en Chiapas no hay basaltos, lo que hay son andesitas. Lo mismo que en Torreón. Ok. Sí. Eh, pienso que ya está un, 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 una controversia que debemos uh, resolver. Uh, fue muy interesante en, en las sesiones de GSA en septiembre. Kathy Busby fue un, ¿cómo se dice? Un, un jefe de un, una sesión. ¿sí? ¿Sí? Jefa. Y dice que tiene un ejemplo. Tu, tuvo un ejemplo de la, la secuencia de uh, rocas ígneas en en el sur de Arizona y dice, este es un arco y, y fue hablando a mí, sí, seguramente, este es un arco y tiene un otro foto de la secuencia nazis y dice, no, este no es un arco. So, ok, ¿cómo sabes? Sí, es, es los, uh, los datos que Re, ¿Cómo se llama? Revisado. Que revis, revis, revisos, revisas, son muy importantes. Pero el problema es porque la mayoría de los, las secuencias uh, de la formación uh, nazis son empobrecidos, pobrecidas en, en rocas ígneas. Y es posible, y tuvimos esta discusión en el pasado y, y, y mi pregunta es, ¿por qué no, no, no vemos los, uh, los batolitos de la formación nazis? Es, es, es como uh, el sistema arco de nazis no, nunca fue exhumado, ¿sí? No, exhumado. Es, 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 un, es un, una observación interesante, pero estoy, es posible, posible que ha visto estos datos, pero Gary Gray tiene un, una muestra cerca de, uh, en, 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 uh, ¿cómo se llama? En, en, uh, La Pacoyan. Uh, um. al, al este de... Um, en Caguasas, en, este, en Guayacocotla. Uh, en, en, en la mesa central. Es, es, un, es un, un, un granito muy, muy famoso, con una edad de como, pienso que es uh, mioceno, pero tiene un, tiene un grupo muy grande de, um, de zircones de jurásico. Pienso que es de, del jurásico. Y mi pregunta es si es posible 
que el batalito jurásico está abajo y esas magmas de, 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 uh -huh. de son, fue contaminado por circones de, de un, un de batalito verdad del, del, uh -huh. de, del, del jurásico que, que ya está en el, en el subsuelo. Bueno, eh, vamos a, a, a tomar una última pregunta que es de Alex Siriondo y después de esa cerramos. Alex. Okay. Hola, buenas tardes, Tim. Gusto verte. Gusto ver a todos los demás. Eh, comentaste que Nancy Macmillan no descarta que la señal calcoalcalina de las rocas jurásicas que estamos discutiendo eh, sea una señal adquirida por por un proceso de contaminación de unos magmas, eh, bueno, contaminación de una corteza de carácter calcalino resultado de la subducción. Pero si fuera ese el caso, ¿qué magmas estaríamos fundiendo? ¿O qué magmas estarían participando en ese proceso de contaminación? Eh, ¿Un arco de qué edad estaríamos fundiendo? Sí, uh... entiendo la pregunta. No entendí la, la parte. Uh, ok, so. Uh, uh, al, al final. In English. So, next, Nancy Macmillan is saying perhaps the calcaline signature we obtain in these Jurassic rocks is related to uh, asthenospheric uh, magmas being contaminated from a pre existing arc. And if she's toying with the idea of a pre existing arc, which arc is that? Pienso que refiere a cualquier arco, cualquier corte, corteza. Es un proceso de contaminación no restringida al, al jurásico o uh, al cenozoico. Es, es, es un problema con el tránsito de magmas uh, a, a través de una corteza que fue construida por procesos diferentes, anteriores. Puedo, permíteme de, de, de hablar un poco sobre cosas que, de que estoy, tengo confianza, de, con que tengo confianza. En, en el caso de, de las rocas equivalente a, a, a la formación nazis que he visto en, en, um, en Chihuahua, la formación plomosos, no hay no hay controversia que estas rocas fueron depositadas en una, una uh, half graben, como se dice, demi graben, que fue uh, activa durante el emplazamiento de la ignia brita en cero de en medio. De en medio hay estratos de crecimiento Um, en, en los estratos jurásico y los, las secciones están mucho más uh, potentes en algunas partes de la cuenca que en, en otras partes de la cuenca. So, es, tengo confianza, estoy seguro que fue extensión en proceso durante el, el emplazamiento de esas ignimbritas. So, si fue un arco, fue un arco extensivo, ¿ok? Podemos, es, estamos de, de acuerdo de, de esta? Estar de acuerdo. Yo creo que sí, todos estamos de acuerdo que es, era extensional, ¿verdad? Lo hemos visto en Chiapas, lo hemos visto en Guayacoco, en todos lados se ve esa, esa relación entre magmatismo y, y extensión. Ok, so en, en este caso, cualquier modelo es, es muy fácil, ¿no? De, de ver cualquier modelo debe tener cuenta de las observaciones estructurales, uh, deposicionales y de geoquímica. Um. Déjame ver. En, en YouTube no hay preguntas. Eh, entonces, eh, yo creo que le agradecemos 
a ti mucho por su presentación y le agradecemos, agradecemos mucho a la audiencia por acompañarnos. ¿Ya? Eh, les muchas deseo a todos. Gracias. Una... ¿Sí? Muchas gracias para la oportunidad y, y me da mucho gusto de, de ver todos en el sur. Yeah, please come back. <laughs> as, as soon as I can. Con gusto. Bueno, muchas gracias a todos.